Today, we will cover a shocking case where several airport employees, pilots, and civilians reported seeing a UFO hovering over Chicago O'Hare International Airport. We will also share the declassified audio during the incident. I'm on a journey of discovery. I'm seeking answers to some of the most challenging mysteries that face mankind and many nuggets of knowledge that could bring those answers are unsolved cases and tales of the strange and unexplained. This show focuses on recounting cases and stories of unknown phenomena, mysterious events, weird places, and the unexpected. So please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment your thoughts on the case we are about to cover. I'm going to share my screen here and let's get straight into it. So it's November 7th, 2006 at O'Hare International Airport at around 4.15 p.m. CST. Numerous credible airline staff and others observed a circular spinning gray metallic object hovering near the United Airlines gate C-17 in Concourse C, 1,900 feet above the ground level. It remained there for about 18 minutes or so, departing between 4.18 and 4.33 p.m. An early observer of the event was a United Airlines worker aiding the pushback of a Boeing 737 from gate C-17, and he felt an unexplainable urge to look up and was surprised to see a craft silently hovering above. And we've heard this little detail before where you're just casually doing your work, you're doing something, maybe you're driving, and you just have this urge to look up and you don't know why that is but you feel it. This isn't the case for everyone, but this is a reoccurring detail that we have seen many times. And so he quickly informed the United Airlines Zone 5 control coordinator and pointed out the object to the cockpit crew of the adjacent airplane, who then opened their windows to get a better look. Simultaneously, another staff member became aware of the mysterious object when he overheard colleagues talking about it on company radios. And one of the people was from United by the name of Sue, and she calls the O'Hare Tower. Take a look at, take, listen to this. O'Hare Tower, this is Dave. Hey, Dave, it's Sue from United Tower. Hey, Sue. Hey, did you see a flying disc out by C-17? Oh, I don't even start, Sue. No, <laughs> Fly, you're seeing flying discs. Well, that's what the pilot and the ramp guys are telling us, the C-17, they saw some flying disc above, and we can't see Come above on, us. Come on, Sue. You can't see it, right? Hey, you guys been celebrating the holidays or anything there or what? You having a Christmas party today? I have not seen anything, Sue. And if I did, I wouldn't admit to it. No, I have not seen any flying disc at gate C-7. Unless you have a new aircraft you're uh, bringing out today that we don't know about. No, I have not seen anything, Sue. All right. If I do, I uh, I don't know what I'll do. If I see it, I guess I'll back it up with you. But no, I'll keep an eye out. Consistently, in all of the shows that we do for Tales of the Strange and Unexplained, and we share declassified audio, there's always jokes. There's always laughter. Have it be a dispatcher team. Have it be air traffic control. It doesn't matter. Have it be policemen. There is this consistent stigma there, the laughter and the jokes, and this is no exception. But according to NARCAP, the National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomena, they conducted an extensive study on the case, resulting in a 152-page report. And you can find that report in the description box below once this live show is over. And while they interviewed several witnesses, their identities do, they are confidential, but nevertheless, their accounts have been shared with the public. And Mark Tasaka, thank you so much. I'm also reading in the live chat, people are eating some snacks and having some drinks. That is so awesome. I, I saw pizza bites in there and you can't go wrong with pizza bites. So this first witness who is only been titled as witness D was in his office when at around 4 30 PM, he caught wind of a company radio announcement discussing a UAP. And without a moment's hesitation, he made his way to the area near gate B five and looking up, he spotted the UAP positioned at a 45 degree angle in the sky. Now this incident caught the attention of the Chicago tribune as well, which is a newspaper. And three months after the incident, 
on January 1st, 2007, an article written by John Helkovich was published interviewing witnesses and attempting to get all of the details about the sighting. So throughout 2007, John mentioned in several interviews that he had to actively seek out witnesses to craft this now famous article about the O'Hare incident. And in a particular conversation with John, witness D recalled standing outside near the gate, I mean, just shocked at what he was looking at, trying to make sense of the extraordinary sighting right before him. And the witness emphasized the potential danger, stating, if someone was floating a weather balloon or any other object over O'Hare, it needed to be halted due to its proximity of our flight activities. He estimated the object's size to be between 6 to 10 feet in diameter and described it as a black, metallic, elliptical, sphere-like object. Witness D saw the UAP ascend rapidly, leaving a blur in its wake. Another colleague, Witness E, was with him, and another staff member, Witness F, mistook the object for a bird. After observing the UAP, Witness D contacted various authorities, including the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration Control Tower, and discussed the sighting with fellow witnesses. And even though there were a handful of witnesses and alleged photographs that were taken during the incident, the tower didn't really take it too seriously. I got a tower, Dwight. Dwight? Yes. What happened to Dave? Did he have to take a break because I called him? No. This is Super United. Yes. There, there was a disc out there flying around. There was a what? A disc. A disc? Can, yeah. can you hang on one second? Sure, do Thanks. I. Okay, I'm sorry. What uh, What can I do for you now? Oh, yeah. All right. There was, I told Dave there was a disc flying outside above Charlie 17, and he thought I was pretty much high. But um, I'm not high, and I'm not drinking. Yeah. Someone actually has a picture of it, so if you guys see it out there. A disc? Like a frisbee? Like a UFO type thing. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> have a picture how, of the how, how high above Charlie 17? Well, it was above our tower. So, uh -huh. if you happen to see him, say... You know what? I'll, I'll keep a peeled eye for that. All right. Okay. Thank you, bye. You hear Dwight, a part of the tower, stating, ah, oh, okay, like very sarcastic, brushing it off very quickly. And Sue, you can tell she sounds very uncomfortable. And there are some people that laugh when they feel nervous. I'm in that category. I know what it's all about. And maybe she wasn't necessarily, like, joking about this, thinking that this was super funny, but she just felt uncomfortable in attempting to even talk about a UFO, this disc-shaped craft. Because when you say the word UFO, you know jokes are going to be blown everywhere. So she was kind of careful in some ways to describe it as a disc-shaped. And then you have Dwight saying, oh, like a frisbee? Really? I mean, you know how small a frisbee is? That thing is tiny. And for so many people, pilots and alleged photographs to be taken of this quote disc uh i don't think it would be a frisbee but hey that's just me now we have to ask ourselves well how big was this ufo well based on its observed position beneath a cloud base of approximately 1900 feet narcap could deduce its potential size and multiple witnesses provided angular size estimates allowing narcap to calculate its possible diameter for instance witness a compared its size to a quarter held at arm's length, suggesting an 88-foot diameter if the UAP was at 1,900 feet. Meanwhile, witness D likened it to a pencil tip, indicating a 22-foot diameter. And while it's kind of tricky to nail down an exact moment of when this happened, we have several accounts to consider because witness A suggests it was at around 4.32 p.m. their time. However, witness B and C lean towards a time closer to 4.18 p.m. And then there's witness D who believes it was somewhere between 4.33 and 4.34 p.m. And while we may not have a precise time, these testimonies give us a ballpark idea of when this phenomenon made its exit. Now, shifting gears just a little bit, let's talk about the media's take on this. 
John Halkovich, a respected journalist for the Chicago Tribune, who, who I mentioned a little bit earlier, shared a humorous remark from Craig Bursick, a union representative and an expert in the tower. And he said, imagine traveling seven million light years to O'Hare only to leave because your gate was occupied. That's just not right. And now while this might elicit a little chuckle like ah, that's so funny it's a bit alarming to see a dismissive attitude towards uap especially when it seems to be a common sentiment in the aviation world today and while some folks genuinely express concern about this incident it is hard to ignore the jokes made in this next recording Power cab, this is dave hey, guys, I'm at I have an interesting one for you, Dave. Some of our employees, I don't know if you heard anything about this, um, some of our pilots on the ground were reporting a UFO sighting at a thousand feet from the sea side of the airport. Did you guys hear anything about that? You know what? The Raptor called me, I want to say about 10, 15 minutes ago. We have not seen anything up there. Okay. Because she said it was right around gate C-17. Okay. But, uh, I mean, and since she called, I've been looking, but we have not seen anything. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean... Uh, if we do, oh well, well, I guess. You know. well, well, no, I'm just wondering. Maybe, yeah. we'll have to, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll have to give him the C7 right. Yeah, yeah, I know. Either that or you, know, you guys unveiled a brand new aircraft that I didn't tell anybody about. I know. But uh, no, we haven't seen anything, but we will uh, surely keep an eye out, that's for sure. Thank you very much. No problems. So, of course, you hear the joke of, oh, if there is this new piece of tech that we don't know about, that might be what it is. What I did find interesting about this particular interaction between Dave and this other person is that this other person kept stating okay and not really giving any feedback while Dave is sharing a lot of extra details. We don't hear that necessarily too often, at least with these types of audio recordings when it comes to any UAP incident. People are pretty caged. They don't want to share what they know. But in this case for Dave, while there were a little bit of laughter, a little bit of jokes here and there, he was willing to share this information with someone who had called into the tower. And that was something that I think is worth mentioning. But now we're getting into the crazy aspect of this of this case, because not only are people seeing this craft in the sky, not only is it being recorded by the air traffic control tower, but there is more to this because the UFO ascended sharply through the 190 foot cloud, leaving a hole roughly its size. OK, I'm going to repeat that this craft allegedly left a donut shaped hole in a cloud and this hole lingered for up to 14 minutes such an occurrence suggests that we might be dealing with an object that's either superheated or radiating now the faa has gone on record stating that there was no radar detection or any visible confirmation from the control tower yet Interestingly, primary radar data from the FAA seems to back up this event. And what's more, an FAA ground controller did make a reference to this UFO at around 3.58 p.m., which was well before the UFO made its exit. And we're going to revise this donut-shaped cloud a little bit later, so just hang on to that in your mind because there's more to this. But then you have Elizabeth Isham Corey, a spokesperson for the FAA, and proposed that what was witnessed was simply a weather anomaly. Nothing to see here. Now, luckily, she didn't say Venus here or Mercury, like we've heard time and time again. But she is mentioning it is just merely a weather anomaly. And she attributed this phenomenon to, an, to atmospheric conditions combined with the lights at the airport. But here's where it gets a little crazy, because the airport's ramp lights weren't even activated at the time. So it's a little, there's a little hole in that aspect of the story. And such explanations, rather than clarifying, only deepen the mystery and fuel skepticism. It's crucial for us to recognize that when official statements appear dismissive, it might discourage other potential witnesses from sharing their experiences. And this is absolutely true. When you give these very mundane explanations, people that witness this might think to themselves, oh, 
that's obviously what it must have been. There's no need for me to call in and, and share my encounter or share my sighting with anyone because obviously it's just Venus or obviously it's just a weather anomaly. And it, it can be very, very discouraging. Um, can that be true sometimes? Yeah for sure. But even if you see something that looks very strange to you and you potentially may have already heard the explanation, it's still worth documenting and giving that sighting to someone who is knowledgeable in the topic at least enough to be able to help you understand what you saw and what you encountered as well. But you also have Sylvia, a coordinator with the United Airlines, was among the first to sound the alarm and she reached out to the FAA tower and even made a company-wide announcement about the UAP sighting. And her line was buzzing with multiple calls about the UFO. Then there's Sue, who we heard a little bit earlier, who contacted the ATC tower at precisely 4.30 p.m. However, they claim to have seen nothing out of the ordinary. And what's intriguing is the 15-minute gap between this reported time and what's recorded in the FAA's official log. In response to this incident, United Airlines swiftly initiated an internal safety assessment the very next day. But here's where it gets odd. By November 10th, they opted out to pursue a full-blown investigation. And to this day, the results of their preliminary review remain unknown. The question is why? What's going on here? Why would they say, okay, we need to have a safety assessment. And then not too long after, in this case, the very next day, they stop the full-blown investigation. There has to be a very, very good reason for that. And unfortunately for us, for the public, we are left in the dark. We don't know what they reported. That information is not has not been made public. And it's devastating, yes, but just that little, that little sentence right there, I think is saying more than what it's, than what it's actually saying on paper, because it's just, we just don't know. They just stopped the reporting. They, they stopped their research and that's it. I don't know. It sounds a little bit sketch if you ask me. It's also worth noting that the FAA has gone on record stating they detected no anomalies on their radar. They went on record saying that. OK, and we, we should keep that in mind. It might be a little valuable a little bit later. And Doc, thank you for that. Love your channel, Christina, especially when you and Jimmy are on the same podcast. Keep up the great work. Thank you for supporting my channel. I do appreciate that. Jimmy right now is in Egypt and he will be back next week. But getting into our next aspect of this case is that a FOIA request filed by journalist John Hilkovich, this guy that we're seeing on screen right here, unveiled some compelling information. And it turns out that there had indeed been communication with air traffic control regarding this mysterious object. Back it up just a little bit bit here, okay? Because the FAA had gone on record stating they detected no anomalies on their radar. But that doesn't mean that people weren't seeing the this object with their naked eye. In a column dated January 1st, 2007, Hilkovich wrote, and I quote, the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, confirmed that its air traffic control tower at O'Hare received a call. This call was from a United supervisor, supervisor inquiring if the controllers had noticed an enigmatic elliptical shaped craft hovering motionless over Concourse C of the United Terminal. Now, while the FAA said they detected nothing unusual on their radar, the pilots, ever vigilant, attempted to continue to exercise this UFO sighting with caution. Ground gateway 5668, penalty box, ready to go to the north port. Ground gateway 5668, you can use Alpha to north port and use caution for the uh, UFOs. Uh, Alpha to north port, we'll take a look. United Maintenance 44. Okay, it's 44. Thank you. Right. 44 is going around the north port. Excellent. Uh, you got Eagle and SkyWest over here that. coming around this way. He's turning in. No fact, you really got no other gate holds. All right. Somebody reported a UFO or a flying disc above Charlie Concourse. Seriously. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so I'll nobody can keep my eyes open. nobody can see it. But use caution. All right. Um, and <laughs> that's <laughs> that's really 
too much yet. Here you hear the laughing at the very end of the clip talking about UFOs. One person that they're going to keep their eye out for it, mentioning that this is excellent, right? All of these little things. And it makes me question here. It truly does. My big question is how often are pilots seeing weird craft in the sky and not reporting it? And all they can do to hide their tracks is to laugh about it. That is a genuine question that I have. Next, we have Megan McCarthy, a spokesperson for United Airlines, had a conversation with journalist John Hilkovich, and she pointed out that their duty manager log, which is designed to capture unusual events, had no records of this particular incident. In her words, she says, I've looked into it and we have no record of such an event. However, here's the however, the plot thickens because a FOIA request made by NARCAP revealed a contrasting narrative. The records indicated not one, not two, but three separate phone inquiries from the United Ramp Tower concerning the UAP. And here's the kicker. One of these calls was indeed documented in the FAA's Towers Daily Records of Facility Operation. Dun, dun, dun. And this revelation certainly raised eyebrows, and it does prompt us to question the transparency and accuracy of the initial statements. Based on the interviews conducted by journalist Hilkovich, it appeared that airline staff were not only questioned by United's management, but were also asked to draft report and sketches that they witnessed. And this is genius. If, if, if you want to look into a case and you want to debunk it or not doesn't matter it is amazing to have people write it down while it's still fresh in their mind to take notes to to do some sketches this is crucial and luckily for the united uh, united's management they seem decently knowledgeable in this topic so much so as to ask pilots to draft what they saw on that day find that a little bit weird as well. But what's more was that there were whispers that they were advised to keep their observations under wraps and to not discuss them with anyone. However, a point of dispute arises right here because the senior editor, John, couldn't find a single airline employee to corroborate this claim. So we hear rumors as it's what this aspect of that little paragraph is. It's a rumor that these pilots weren't able to talk about it outside of the United management. But when he asked about it, when John Helkovich was asking, hey, is this true? No one said anything. Were they did not say anything because they were scared. Did they not say anything because it's true? There are so many layers to this story. And there's also so many layers to the human psyche as well. People lie all the time. They've lied since the beginning of time. And you learn to lie at the age of like three or four. And then you get better at it as you get older. Now, some people are absolutely terrible at it. And those are the purest souls right there. But when we're looking at this, it's very easy to say, no, no, I, I didn't. I didn't see anything. And you kind of look away and you, and you walk really fast at a little coffee shop, right? Grab a cup of coffee, and just keep on running. But in some instances, it's not that easy to lie. Now, in this case for John, he's a journalist. He's not a walking lie detector. So he could only take their word for it and say, OK, well, if you say so, then I'm just going to write this down and at least document it. Now, one might wonder, is it possible that pilots from a predominant airline might have spotted the UFO as they approached the airport that day. While this is a tantalizing possibility, as the release of this report, it remains just that a possibility. But to add another layer to this mystery, in the upcoming audio clip, you'll hear one individual urging another to glance out the window in search of this alleged UFO. Take a listen. Okay, wait, 5668. 5668, go ahead. Yeah, look out your window. Do you see anything above United's concourse? They actually, believe it or not, they called us and said there's a 
Somebody observed a flying disc about a thousand feet above the uh, Gate Charlie 17. You see anything over there? Not that I can tell. Okay. Yeah, I thought my job was stressful. <laughs> well, we saw it a half hour ago. Who saw it? A whole bunch of us over at the uh, Charlie Concourse. Really? You guys did? Who's this? It was the United Taxi Mechanic. Did you hear that at the very end? I thought it was a balloon, but I'm not sure. I need to emphasize that this take that this case took place back in 2006. A lot of stigma there. However, during that time frame, people were knowledgeable in UFOs. People people knew the basic stories. They were still into all the sci-fi movies as well that were happening in the 80s onward. People were familiar with this very well, but they also knew the explanations such as weather balloons which this guy from the taxi mechanic was was kind of kind of thinking it might have been but he wasn't sure because he, he's not necessarily you know he's not a ufo expert at least to our understanding we don't actually know who this person is he did not come forward all we know is that he is a taxi mechanic but these audio clips are incredible because we're able to hear alive i mean in the sense of while it was happening while they were seeing this while they were having these conversations we are able to catch it in that moment and we only have a few clips of what happened back in 2006 at the o'hare airport which is a bit sad how how much other how, how like is there more audio that wasn't declassified that could have been even more compelling than what we've heard thus far? If you are enjoying the show, hit that like button. It lets me know that you're enjoying the show. And it tells the brutal YouTube algorithm that you want more UFO content on your page. So the Chicago Tribune brought to light that several witnesses voiced their frustration to the publication. And they were upset by the lack of investigation by both the government and the airline concerning the incident. To quote an alleged airline United Airlines baggage handler witness, he says, in an age where terrorism is at its forefront and TSA is intense with um, with all these weird objects that have to come in through the machines and they freak out when it's something wild, why are they not freaking out about UFOs? It defies logic. And we are one of the busiest airports in the United States. And to give you a sense of how intense the O'Hare Airport is, an Associated Press article from July 3rd, 2006, citing government data, declared O'Hare as the nation's busiest airport for the first half of that year. It handled a staggering 477,000 flights, both departures and arrivals. And Wendy Abrams from the Chicago Department of Aviation adaptly stated, O'Hare isn't just an airport. It's a linchpin in both national and international aviation. And to paint an a, even clearer picture of this immense flight traffic, U.S. airlines operated 8.8 .8 million scheduled domestic and international flights across all airports in the first 10 months of 2006. October 2006 alone saw a little over 900,000 flights. Now let's zoom in on O'Hare. Its air traffic controllers routinely handled about 96 incoming flights every hour. That's roughly one flight every 38 seconds, often spread across multiple runways. When we're looking at it from that perspective, just putting in the, the math, putting in the facts here, you are dealing with a lot of pilots. You're dealing with a lot of people on the planes, you're dealing with a lot of people in the airport. You're dealing with a lot of people in general. And for, for this alleged UFO sighting to have happened in one of the busiest airports during that time frame, 
It's it's unbelievable. It's shocking. And then, of course, you want to ask yourself, oh, but then where is the video evidence? Where where are the photos? Why are more people coming forward? Why isn't the story as famous as it should be? Right. These are all very, very, very valid questions. I am with you on that. And it's so valid that my voice just cracked there. But this is also 2006. Phones weren't that great. People still they were still using camcorders. And for the most part, you're not really taking a lot of pictures while you're at the airport. Now in today's world in 2023, everyone has a phone out. Everyone's taking pictures. Everyone's posting on their story of where they're going, taking their selfies, right? 2006 was a different time when it comes to socializing with people. Social media wasn't a big thing just yet, but it, it's not an excuse necessarily for us not having picture evidence and video evidence. And what's odd is that in one of the earlier recordings that I shared with you, Sue mentioned, oh, we even have pictures of it. But where are those pictures? We haven't seen them. They haven't been made public. Where are they? What happened? That's something that has really been gnawing my mind there is she mentioned this, but where is it? What happened? I want to hear your thoughts on that aspect. But one of the most captivating aspects of this incident is the reported hole in the clouds. I told you we were going to revise it and here we are. So this suggests that whatever was seen that day had a profound effect on its surroundings. While researchers can't pinpoint exactly what the object was, the evidence leans towards it having a genuine physical object. The FAA stance concludes that the sighting was caused by a weather phenomenon and that the agency would therefore not be investigating the incident, even though they stated that, oh, but we are going to have a safety assessment. And then it was terminated the very next day. And according to an astronomer by the name of Mark Hammergren, weather conditions on that day of the sighting were just right, like the Goldilocks story, right, was just right for the hole punch cloud, also known as the fall streak hole, which is a very unusual weather phenomenon to begin with. The object was seen in the sky, just to kind of give you a little bit of a, a, a just backing up just a little bit here, because we are aware that an object was seen in the sky, right? And then after a few minutes, it just vanished. Now, in many cases, during many people's sightings, a UFO does not leave anything in their tracks. You see it one moment, you don't see it the next, and that's it. But this craft left a telling sign of its presence, a clear circular gap in the clouds. A trusted source confirmed to NARCAP that this cap that this gap was visual, visible, excuse me, around 4.20 p.m., suggesting the object had just left. And this intriguing cloud formation persisted for a good five to 10 minutes. And the enigma we're left with is what exactly was this object and what brought it to that particular spot? Let's just say, let's just Let's just go a little crazy here for a second. Let's just use our imagination just for a moment. Let's have a little bit of fun here. Let's say it was aliens, all right? It wasn't terrestrial. It wasn't made here on Earth, but it, it had extraterrestrial origin. Let's just go there. Let's just have fun for that just for a moment. Why? Why would you want to go to one of the busiest airports in the United States just to spend a few minutes there and then to punch a hole through a cloud and then leave? What's going on? Is there more to the airport? Were they maybe invited there? Who knows? Was it just for fun? Like a little a little tourist trip, maybe? Or was it was it man-made? Did did humans make it? I have no idea. But these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves that we should muse about. And while we might not have the answers, which is sad, I will be honest there, it's worth looking into. And when we're able to use our imagination, when we're able to ask questions, it is helping human evolution. This is 
the most important conversation that humanity is having right now is looking at this UFO phenomenon. And you might ask yourself, why, Christina? Why do you say this so often? Well, one aspect to this is when we're looking at this bigger picture, when we see our planet as merely a speck in the universe, our problems, our issues, our sadness, us being a little bit upset means almost nothing. And yes, while we might think that the world revolves around us and only our emotions are important and our experiences in some, in some ways they are because only you are experiencing it. And every single person is going through some sort of suffering. Doesn't matter who it is. There is someone if not everyone, that is going through something in their life. But when you are able to see the bigger picture, it, it alleviates a little bit of the problems that you're going through in your life. And that is something that I love about these mysteries is that I'm able to jump out of my life and look into something bigger than myself. And this is why, in my opinion, one of many aspects, why this is one of the most important conversations that humanity is having, because it's going to lead to human evolution more so than other aspects. Of course, technological advancements, that's a very big deal. And when, when we can couple that with space exploration at some point in time. I'm going to assume here it's going to be required in any college degree that you're going to have to study extraterrestrial life, astrobiology, something or other, because we are a spacefaring species. We are meant to explore. And when we have the proper equipment, when we have the proper understanding of our of 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 the universe, of space, of our solar system better than ever before, we will be able to travel and hopefully be able to interact with other intelligent species. But we have to start off small and think to ourselves, well, the world does not revolve around us. There is so much more out there. And it all starts with one thought, asking one question, what is really going on here? So what's what's the big takeaway of this case? Why are we covering this? Well, at the O'Hare International Airport, numerous witnesses reported a small, seemingly solid object hovering over the United Airlines concourse for an extended period exceeding a about 18 minutes. And despite its evident presence, this object eluded radar detection and remained unnoticed by air traffic controllers. And that's in quotation marks right there, presenting a potential risk to flight operations. And they are right here. You're going to hear the narrative of, oh, yes, UFOs, they are, they are a threat following that threat narrative. And I've covered this many times. I'm just going to touch on it this time. And that is, if it's not a threat narrative, when we're dealing with the government and the military, everything to them is a threat. And if it's not, they're not going to put funding. They're not going to do research on it. If it is classified as a threat, they're going to put they're going to put their eyes on it. They're going to look a little bit more into it. And while you might not agree with a threat narrative, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't. It's it's about the research. It's about the funding for it. And if everything is happy, sunshine, unicorn, rainbows, and ramen, right? People aren't going to care. They're not going to look into it as much as seeing, okay, there's an issue here. It's a safety issue. We need to look into this. We need to be safe. We have the right equipment to in order to protect our people, right? Okay, but now let's talk about numbers. Calculations indicate that this UAP exhibited a high energy density, and this might explain the reported hole it left in the cloud as it ascended. To give you a sense of its power, if the UAP was approximately 6.8 meters in diameter, it would require a staggering 100 megawatts of power to evaporate water droplets in a 300 meter cloud column in just one second. To put this into perspective, that's significantly more power than a B-747 airplane consumes during cruise. And this event underscores a reoccurring challenge. Unidentified phenomena often slip past radar systems, resulting in a lack of official acknowledgement and action. The FAA's hesitancy to delve into such sightings, often citing a lack of concrete evidence, is indeed a cause for concern. NARCAP hopes that this report 
contributes to the mounting evidence surrounding UAP and urges U.S. officials to enhance their detection methods so that we can keep our airspace safe and to better understand this mystery. And they are absolutely right. I would like to repeat that the NARCAP report will be in the description box below once this live show is over for you to read it in more detail. It is a 152-page report where they go into detail on the sightings, on the witnesses, on the weather that day as well, and kind of brushes aside that this that's, that, that, that this was merely a weather anomaly, something so mundane, something so simple, simple because it's not adding up with how the weather was during that time frame in order to create that type of donut cloud. Did you enjoy this story today? Did you enjoy this case? Let me know in the live chat. Please let me know in the comments as well. It is one that's absolutely fascinating. Honestly, any case that has air traffic control tower audio or dispatch audio or any kind of audio that was created by law enforcement officials, government officials, things of this nature, it truly captivates me. And I know it does for you as well. Being able to share these audio recordings with you it does it does truly make me happy because we're able to have these conversations and then we're able to layer on the case with these audio recordings to give us a better understanding of what these people were going through, maybe what they were feeling, what they were thinking in some aspects as well. And in this case, compared to the Hudson Valley um, case that we covered with that. We also shared audio recording. This one, in, in the aspects for Sue and for Dave here today, they were curious. And yes, while they were laughing and throwing a little bit of jokes, I really do feel as if they went home that day, sat in their bed, and just, and just thinking to themselves, what just happened? What conversation did I have? Did anyone else actually see this UFO like I heard? when I was talking to Sue and others, right? I really think that hopefully it impacted their lives and maybe they got interested in the UFO phenomenon after they had that encounter. Because for many people, I wouldn't say everyone, but for a good majority of people that have a sighting, have some sort of encounter, it changes their life forever and it changes their perspective on life as well. And then you begin to gravitate towards people that have similar interests because Honestly, before 2017, if you were to have a, a conversation like this with others, people would kind of look at you with a glazed look and maybe think that you're crazy or that they don't want to listen to you because you, there's no interest for them. Right now, we're having a different conversation where people are more interested in this, where we have had UFO hearings, UFO witness hearings for the Pentagon. Other countries have had their own types of hearings. Other countries have UFO offices, right? We are coming towards something. I'm not really sure what, but we're coming towards something to where we are able to have these conversations more openly. And then you can ask yourself, well, what does disclosure mean? Everyone has their own definition. Some say we're already having disclosure as we speak. Some say it'll happen when the government is transparent. Some say it'll happen when a, a huge mothership shows itself to the world. Everyone has their own definition of uh, of disclosure here, but I think that we are we are on the right tide. We are in the right direction in so many ways, not in every way, but in so many ways to be able to have this conversation more freely. But let me know your thoughts, your insights, your opinions are very valuable to me. So please share a comment. Please share in the live chat what you have to say about this case. I want to say thank you to everyone watching this live. All the super chat super stickers youtube members patreon supporters and all of my amazing moderators as well i would like to mention that tomorrow there will not be mysteries with the history but there will be strange news on friday at 3 p.m pst so please make sure to hit the notification bell on youtube and subscribe so that you do not miss that live show 
If you want to continue this conversation, bring it over to the Discord server with 2,000 other like-minded members. Share your thoughts, your insights, your experiences, and more. Also, follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies for all of my updates and news. And then also take a look at my Instagram at strange paradigms for pictures and short videos. If you are enjoying all the content that you are seeing on this channel, do consider being a Patreon supporter. All the funding goes straight to the channel to Puck the Puck Wedgie and to the RV fund, where I'll be traveling the United States, hitting all the UFO and paranormal hotspots, documenting it, and taking you on the journey with me. That is it for today. I will see you on Friday for strange news. Be safe, and remember, keep your eyes on the skies. <laughs>